Okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and we would like to welcome you to the webinar with um, CTI Connect and Blink Networks. And the webinar is titled uh, Part 1 of the Private LTE Networks. It's crucial to your business. So I'd like to introduce, uh, start out by introducing um, uh, Gary Kellner from CTI Connect. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining today. Um, a lot of familiar names as far as attendees go here, but it's also some new ones. So I'm just going to give you a quick brief background of CTI Connect um, and the uh, convergence of families of companies as well. So we are celebrating our 25th year anniversary, started doing business in 1995. We are a uh, premier distributor of fixed wireless equipment, telecom, and network infrastructure. Um, Blink Networks is one of our newer partners that we are uh, a uh, master distributor for as well. Um, so the majority of the, the markets that we service are ISPs, utilities, government enterprise, transportation, and industrial networks. We're providing distribution sales into North America and the Caribbean. Um, the services that we offer, world-class engineering, network design, and superior supply chain. We have two distribution warehouses, one in Burr Ridge, Illinois, and then another in Round Rock, Texas. Our sales executives offer a total system solution with a personal expert touch. Um, CTI Connect is part of the Convergence um, Technologies, our uh, family of companies, Convergence. Um, and then we also in, have our in-house brand, Apex 9. Um, it's a brand of hardware and accessories at competitive pricing. So as I mentioned, CTI Connect is part of the, the Convergence of Families. Um, Mitotech is a sister company of Convergence or to CTI Connect. They offer IT network and infrastructure services. Um, all, another company is IPPay. They are payment processing gateway and billing service. And then INET Capital is a leasing, financial, and loan service. Um, and with that, we'll hand it over to Dan with Blink Networks. Um, Dan, before you begin, I uh, just wanted to uh, let everyone know that there, um, that everyone is uh, using high bandwidth or a lot of internet nowadays. So if there's any intermittent issues, um, please bear with us. It's just that everybody is using the, um, the internet for their um, meetings and webinars. And if you have any questions, please use the Q&A. Uh, question and answer box um, on your screen, and we will answer the um, answer any questions towards the end. Okay, go ahead, Dan. Thank you. Okay, um, I say yours. I am there. We go. <laughs> I say it didn't seem like it uh, gave me the capability to change the screen. My name is Dan Stewart. I'm a systems engineer, uh, sales engineer at. Blink Networks. I've uh, been working here for uh, the past uh, eight months. Uh, prior to that, I was with uh, Telrad, and prior to that, I was with Ericsson. I've been in the market, uh, the wireless uh, market here for almost 30 years, so I'm kind of dating myself. Um, so what we're going to be talking about here, uh, I don't know why the screen isn't changing. I am not I don't seem to have control over the screen. Um, try to move your arrow. Do you have the arrow? Yeah, I am. Okay. I'll, if you just let me know, I'll move to the next. I'll advance to the next screen. Give me a second. I apologize. I'm, I'm trying to change it right now, and it's not happening. So, yeah, let's go to the next screen. Give me one minute. There we go. There we Sorry go. Sorry about that. So, uh, so what we're going to be uh, talking about here is a very basic understanding of what LTE is, uh, the spectrums that are used. We're going to talk about some sample cases, and we're going to spend a little bit more time on CDRS. Uh, and then finally, we're going to talk about Blink Solutions. Um, one thing I want to make sure that you guys are aware of is that this is a very high-level um, uh, uh, slide set of slides here. Um, if you ask an engineer to tell you what a private LTE network is going to want about, you know, eight hours to explain it, you know, and I've got, you know, like one slide. <laughs> so, 
So I just want to keep you guys uh, aware of that. Feel free to ask questions. There will be a part two of this where we'll be diving in a little bit deeper. But uh, yeah, let's go go ahead and go forward. So Blink Networks. Uh, Blink Networks uh, was founded in 2020 and was acquired in 2016 by a company called Communications Components Incorporated. Uh, CCI is one of the largest suppliers of base station infrastructure products in North America. Uh, one of the top five manufacturers with over $80 million in sales. Uh, one of our largest customers is AT&T. So we've got a real big uh, backing behind us. Uh, all the Blink and CCI products are manufactured in their own manufacturing facilities. Um, we have one in China where we employ over 700 employees. Uh, all the U.S. logistics and inventory are covered uh, by uh, our, our are done in uh, New Jersey. Uh, Blink's research and development facilities are in Ottawa and Toronto. We have over 20 patents related to wireless technologies, beam forming, interference management. Uh, our key engineering team was actually uh, the team that founded Redline. So those of you who are familiar or using Redline products, um, we, our, our CTO and many of the uh, engineers are actually from that company. Um, and they designed the first YMAX certified solutions, um, pretty impressive stuff. So um, lots, of, lots of really strong background in uh, LTE design. Next slide. So what is private LTE? Uh, LTE stands for long-term evolution. Uh, it's basically, uh, private LTE is basically a standards based on the 3GPP LTE uh, standard, but it's scaled down to fit the needs of particular entities. Um, and these entities can include very large corporations, uh, industrial automotive manufacturing, you name it, utility metering, logistics, drones, transportation hubs, government facilities. I mean, I could just go on and on, uh, but basically what it is, it's a controlled environment as opposed to the public LTE networks, it's a controlled environment uh, that allows uh, the LTE take advantage of all the commercial carrier networks uh, uh, capabilities, which include reliability, security, mobility, compatibility. We're going to talk a little bit about that uh, a little bit more. Um, traditional MNOs, uh, the mobile network operators, um, obviously they can operate private LTE networks for companies and they have deployed such. But the real new players on the block are the enterprise IT departments, neutral host network providers like uh, Boingo, uh, and cable operators like Charter uh, that are providing their own managed and private LTE network service. Next slide. So why is private LTE the right choice? Um, I just threw out a few of these uh, primary reasons. I'm not going to go over every one of them, but uh, we'll, we'll talk about a few of them. Uh, one of them is coverage. Um, organi organizations that are deploying LTE can guarantee their coverage as opposed to having to be, uh, you know, uh, 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 covered by private or the public LTE where, you know, you can, uh, Certain areas, you know, it's the can you hear me now thing, right? Certain areas, you know, where you totally drop the uh, connectivity. Um, well, you can create your own private network uh, by uh, installing your own private LTE uh, equipment and cover very particular areas. Uh, you're going to hear about Blink products where we actually have products that operate uh, in the, uh, the 3.5 gig CBRS band but they're able to operate really long distances. Um, when I talk about long distances, we're talking uh, five to seven miles potentially out. It all depends on the, uh, the uh, terrain. Um, uh, but uh, so, so the, coverage, the coverage can also be filled in with GAP products. We've got a, another product that we're going to talk about, the X300i, which is a very good GAP product. It's a, uh, it's a class A CDSD device. 
Um, and uh, so there's lots of products that you can use to fill out and maintain uh, your network and, and fill in any holes, basically. So um, as far as capacity, that's one thing that's really, really important you have to realize with LTE compared to any of the other uh, products that you see out there for wide area networking. Much of those products are operating in the 5 gig, which is a contention-based um, uh, bands, meaning that, uh, you know, it's basically a free-for-all out there. It's an unlicensed spectrum. And if there's a transmitter transmitting, if you're doing Wi-Fi, part of the Wi-Fi algorithm requires that you back off and then retry uh, in the face of interference. Well, LTE doesn't work that way because LTE uses uh, spectrum, the entire spectrum. Uh, and so uh, uh, as far as security, uh, LTE benefits from the network topology or technology exactly like the cellular networks. Um, but they can control their own security, so they can prioritize um, users, and they can specify specific users that can that can utilize that product, and they can also customize that uh, to uh, particular needs. They can uh, adjust uh, adjust the uh, LTE parameters uh, for a challenging physical environment. So the other, the last thing. I don't know that it's up there, but one of the most important things is ease of deployment. Ten years ago, if you'd asked me if it's easy to deploy uh, LTE, I would say, you know, well, unless you got a guy with a, you know, PhD in LTE, it's going to be difficult. Um, but today, we've uh, with the uh, with the technology advancements, we've been able to uh, bring uh, private LTE enterprises into very cost-effective, very easy, fast to deploy. Um, and uh, we've been able to do things like integrations of the, uh, of the EPC. And we'll talk about that uh, uh, in a few minutes. Uh, but so these are just some of the uh, obvious uh, needs, or, or ob not needs, but some of the obvious uh, reasons why choosing LTE is the right, is the right one. Um, the last one I want to talk about is interoperability. Interoperability is really key. So uh, if 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 you're out there, uh, you know, uh, using a uh, fixed wireless uh, network system that's proprietary, the problem that you have with that is that moving on to the next uh, latest and greatest technology is going to require a forklift upgrade. With LTE, you don't have those issues. Um, you can literally today uh, take products uh, that are LTE uh, that are LTE specifications, and you can integrate those into other networks. Uh, an example is the Telrad uh, uh, Telrad uh, equipment. Let's say if you're a Telrad uh, provider, you can easily switch over to a Blink network uh, uh, equipment because they're all LTE compatible. So interoperability is really really key. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Just enough time on that. Okay, so uh, so the basic LTE tech, uh, architecture um, kind of looks like this. Uh, if you can hit the uh, hit the forward forward button, I think I got a slide. So yeah, so so the user equipment basically the user equipment is any device that allows us 4G network communication. In other words, any equipment that adheres to the rules of 3GPP and communicates with the LTE towers. Uh, examples are tablets, smartphones, IoT devices, as well as fixed uh, uh, indoor and outdoor customer premise equipment. Um, next one, yeah, the, e the EU trans. So that's a mouthful of, uh, uh, of words there. It's, uh, it's called the Universal Mobile Telecommunication System terrestrial radio access network. What the heck is that? So uh, at, the, at the end of the day, basically it's a network created by LTE radio towers um, called ENOD. And these ENODs form the heart of the powerful LTE network called the U-Trans. It's the job of the ENODs to control the otherwise dumb UEs, send them signaling messages to perform various tasks, handle their over-the-air signals, dynamic scheduling, um, 
forward core network signals, all that sort of thing. Um, let's go ahead to the next slide or the next, yeah. So the EPC, so the EPC brings all this together. You can't have an LTE network. You can't deploy a, a base station without an LTE or without a EPC. EPC is basically the back end. Uh, it's the control center, if you will. It includes multiple functionalities like uh, authentications of CPEs, SIM and management, security, administration, user services, radio profiles. Uh, this is where the IP address assignments come from. Bandwidth man management and QoS. Um, there's uh, there's multiple entities within that EPC. Uh, one's called the MME. Uh, another is the SGW, the PGW, and the HSS. Um, in part two of this, we're going to be digging in a little bit deeper and talking about what those entities uh, involve. But uh, basically, the EPC is uh, is the core of the network. So now we're going to talk about uh, the LTE spectrum. Um, let's go to the next slide. So I, I, I this is a little bit of a joke. Uh, but, uh, but it actually represents pretty much what's going on in the uh, electromagnetic spectrum in the U.S. Pretty much all the spectrum that's out there is all allocated. So for LTE deployments, you're either going to purchase a license band. Uh, very few are available, and, uh, and if not, you're going to be relegated to use the unlicensed spectrum, which is you know, not really a viable alternative for uh, companies that want uh, high reliability, uh, uh, they're, you know, they're, they're good. They're, they've been the workhorse in the five gigahertz band, but they can't provide the, uh, the uh, reliability that a LTE system can provide simply because you have spectrum that you own, essentially. So let's go to the next slide. So, um, so LTE spectrum for the fixed wireless access, um, I think everybody would uh, would agree that the demand is limitless. Um, you're constantly uh, being bombarded by customers and specifications that require more and more and more higher bandwidth. Uh, uh, the problem is the resources is finite. So we already talked a little bit about this, the license spectrum. Uh, carriers can license their spectrum to enterprises. Um, unlicensed spectrum, you know, it's uh, it's good. Uh, it's been the workhorse for years, but it can't deliver the reliability uh, that uh, that a license band spectrum is. And so, what we come upon is the shared spectrum. The shared spectrum is basically a private LTE network that is operating in the 3.5 gigahertz band. Uh, called CBRS. We're going to talk about that next, um, or in a bit, <laughs> I should say. Let's go ahead and next, next slide. So this is just a little bit more uh, uh, to help you understand. The, the 2.5 gigahertz licenses, uh, most of them are already uh, acquired. Um, there are spectrum holding companies that still uh, lease out some spectrums, but most of that spectrum is located in very uh, uh, rural areas. Um, and even in the rural areas, they're difficult to find. Um, it's a fantastic spectrum because it has really great propag propagation. So everything's really nice about it, but the biggest, cost, biggest, biggest issue is just the cost of acquiring the spectrum. So in the 5 gigahertz spectrum, you know, uh, the issue is propagation challenges, right? So your maximum uh, ERP is 36 dBm. So uh, with uh, lower output power, you're not able to go near the distance. And the technology also doesn't lead itself uh, to, to be able to handle uh, interference. Um, and I know that if you're operating in the, uh, in the 5 gigahertz band right now, you know what I'm talking about. You know, Bob's big boy and uh, ISP can, you know, uh, start up a network today, operate in that same band, and just give you all kinds of headaches. So there's real challenges there. Um, 
so that really takes us to the 3.5 gigahertz spectrum. Uh, the 3.5 gigahertz spectrum uh, operates it, uh, between uh, 3.55 and 3.70. It's 150 megahertz. It operates between band 42 and band 43. Next. So uh, it operates uh, in, in the uh, scenario of creating user priorities where federal incumbents can operate in that band uh, exclusively. And if you're operating in that band, you cannot interfere with them. Um, so what does that mean? Basically, what we're talking about is the U.S. Navy. So if you're uh, you know, within 150 miles of, uh, of the coast, um, there is a chance that a U.S. Navy uh, uh, ship could come into that area, turn on their radar, and, uh, and it would trigger what's called an ESC. ESCs are environmental sensing capability. They're basically sensors that are deployed all across the coast, um, and it could trigger that, and, and as such, uh, the, SA, the SAS, which is a spectrum access server, I'm kind of jumping around here a little bit, uh, but the SAS could actually tell uh, your radios that you need to either turn down your power or to change a channel. So that's really kind of what CBRS is going to be doing. We're, we haven't really gotten to the CBRS slide, but that's really what's going on. Um, so the, the if you can bear with me just so, uh, so the band, uh, again, it's 150 megahertz. Um, the top 50 megahertz is dedicated to GAA. Now, that's not to say that a federal incumbent can't cause, uh, 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 cause you to have to uh, change channels. It can't. Because remember, it's the top tier. Uh, but PALs, the, the PALs are the uh, private auction uh, licenses uh, that uh, will be available in, uh, well, those, they're going to start uh, auctioning in July of 2020 this, this year. Uh, the PALs can only operate in the lower 100 megahertz. And they also only have the capability of operating 70 of the 100 megahertz. Okay, um, and a little bit more about that. Just to be just to be clear on that. So, out of those uh, 70 megahertz, um, the CBRS spectrum is actually divided, uh, divvied up by counties. So, each county uh, in the U.S. Uh, will be an auction. Uh, there, there will be an auction available, and. And a PAL user, a single PAL user can only accommodate or can only license 40 megahertz. So the only way that you could see all 70, 70 megahertz being utilized would be two, uh, two priority license users uh, operating that specific county that have license. So, and I think I've already talked about the dynamic protection areas. Um, so there's a lot of alphabet suit, you know, Citizens Broadband Radio Service, CBRS, the DPA, Dynamic Protection Areas, the ESC, Environmental Sensing Capabilities, all kinds of little uh, 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 alphabet soup uh, acronyms that, you, uh, that you'll get used to if you're operating in these bands. But that's pretty much the gist of CBRS. CBRS, uh, it's uh, the CBRS Alliance uh, is actually the governing body and uh, it has changed its name to ONGO. So if you see products that say they're ONGO certified, these are products um, that are certified through the CBRS Alliance uh, organization uh, to be uh, interoperable with each other. Okay, uh, let, me, uh, let me move to the next one here. So this is a, this is an architectural view, if you will, of the CBRS. The CBSDs, those are the base stations down on the, uh, down on the right-hand corner. Um, these are the base stations that basically transmit and talk to the UEs, if you will. 
Um, up above that, you have network management systems. Um, it's, it's an optional, you don't have to have that. Um, you also don't have to have the domain proxy. Blink equipment, actually, uh, we have our own network management system that offers domain proxy, but it will also, uh, you don't have to utilize that. You don't have to have uh, the domain proxy. Our CDSBs will actually communicate directly to the SAS. So this, what the SAS, what the SAS is doing is, basically authorizes and manages the use of the spectrum in the CDRS. That's its primary function. And it's there to protect, number one, the federal incumbents, the U.S. Navy and uh, fixed satellite services, and number two, the, uh, the PALs, um, those that have the license band. So a CBSD is basically a fixed base station. We already talked about that. Um, we already talked about the domain proxy. If you have any questions about that, just let me know. Uh, but uh, the bottom line is the SAS, uh, you know, divvies up the frequency uh, and spectrum. You can request a certain spectrum, but if that spectrum is actually being used, um, you have to, the, when I say you, the equipment has to uh, uh, facilitate any request from the SAS, which could be to change to a different channel or to lower the power. There we go. So, so uh, the uh, the success of CBRS is really dependent upon the technology being adopted. And uh, early on, there was there was obvious concern about that because without having uh, UE devices um, uh, that are certified and able to use you're probably not going to get a very big deployment. Um, but that uh, has been laid to rest. Now we've got uh, companies like Sierra Wireless, Cradle Point, uh, Sequans, Corning, a whole bunch of different companies that actually are building integrated radios, uh, dongle systems that can be integrated uh, into things like uh, autonomous vehicles. Uh, we've got uh, a couple of customers that are looking at uh, using autonomous vehicles, uh, delivering uh, products across uh, oil uh, oil ranges and uh, solar panel farms, that sort of thing that uh, can actually deliver all the product necessary. Um, so these are actually um, being guided through the use of the, L the private LTE. And then, of course, we've got a whole lot of consumer handsets now. Um, this is a list that I compiled probably – um, six months ago, so I know it's uh, I know it's expanded, but uh, you know Samsung Galaxy S10, the Pixel 3, uh, the Apple iPhone, uh, these are just uh, some of them that are already certified in Band 48, which is CBRS. So we're going to talk a little bit about private LTE uh, use cases. Um, the the thing I want you to keep in mind is pretty much. Wherever there's wireless, you can deploy LTE now. Um, it's not just an outdoor fixed wireless access opportunity. Um, you can do you can deploy this indoors, uh, indoors and outdoors uh, for pretty much every imaginable uh, possible solution. So we're going to talk about just a few of those. So the first one, obviously, is a fixed wireless access. Um, a lot of uh, the WISPs that are out there are already holding uh, licenses in the 3650 to 3700 uh, megahertz band today, so the, that upper 50 megahertz. So CBRS has just uh, opened up that lower 100 megahertz to be able to operate. We're seeing a lot of fixed wireless access opportunities um, that are partnering with utility companies. Utility companies have... Uh, you know, the existing infrastructure. They've got, obviously, the power, but they also have the uh, infrastructure, the physical infrastructure, to be able to mount uh, radios on. So we're seeing a lot of this kind of thing happening. Um, as far as deploying CBRS, uh, the most important thing as an engineer that I could tell you is that training is the key to success. Um, there's uh, CPI classes, Certified Professional Installers, um, there's CPI classes, and you have to be CPI 
uh, to, to, to basically install any CBSD uh, device. And uh, there's also classes basically on CBRS in general. So I would highly recommend those. If you, uh, if you want to learn more about it, feel free to contact me and I can pass you on to those. So private LTE cases, uh, use cases. So um, some example are airports, hospitals, hotels. You guys can read the list. It just goes on and on. Uh, anything that requires critical communications for security and reliability, um, that's what it boils down to. We see a lot of remote vehicle and equipment control uh, 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 use cases. Uh, farms are uh, utilizing uh, automatic uh, uh, remote vehicle control and automated guided vehicles, uh, industrial mining, uh, like I said, gas and oil fields, um, things like point of sale and mobile kiosks. We actually we actually have an interesting uh, uh, interesting use case that's uh, popping up as a result of the COVID-19, where uh, where kids are because they're not able to attend school now they require uh, internet access and to some of the uh, the rural and uh, uh, the rural areas where uh, that capability is not there um, we're, we've actually seen a couple of companies that are looking at deploying uh, uh, CBSD devices in kind of a uh, uh, mobile uh, uh, non-permanent uh, installation. They're actually using uh, school buses to mount uh, the equipment on the top, and they, you know, bring a bring a uh, school bus up to a particular area and put up a base station and uh, transmit LTE signals uh, out to an area of. Uh, anywhere from you know a quarter mile up to three or four miles, uh, just to cover uh, uh, those that don't have internet access. Um, and uh, you know the federal government is actually uh, financing this sort of thing. So lots of really cool things going on. So in the midst of uh, this crisis, it's it's cool to see that sort of thing going on. So um, you know when you talk about airports. Um, before I moved to Colorado, uh, I actually lived in Atlanta. I did a lot of work with Delta Airlines. And Delta Airlines, pretty much every device that you can think of is wireless these days. And, you know, Wi-Fi has been the workhorse, but the bottom line is, you know, it's like I said, uh, you know, anybody can put up their own Wi-Fi device and add to the noise. There's no licensing restriction. So LTE is actually a perfect fit for this sort of thing where they require a very specific latency uh, and capacity. Uh, another example is, uh, you know, uh, like a wind turbine uh, farms. You know, they're geographically uh, fairly large, uh, but they have uh, their capability, they have necessity uh, to be able to deliver information anywhere from, you know, the sensors uh, on the actual equipment to the uh, to the field engineer using handheld computing to uh, uh, to do maintenance and that sort of thing. So, um, very very large opportunities, obviously, and factory automation is just another one. So, so what does Blink Technologies uh, bring into the table? So, Blink products are designed for fixed wireless access. Um, we are uh, introducing mobility, but uh, its, uh, its strongest uh, push is basically for fixed wireless access. Um, our products are designed specifically around uh, link adaptation for foliage and wind. Um, we have uh, uh, very evolved power control systems. Um, we're gonna talk a little about our multi-sector antenna uh, the really cool thing about uh, the thing I love about our product is that it's fully integrated into an easy deployable box. You don't have external antennas. You don't have an external GPS. You can literally put it up and cover 360 degrees uh, of an area by just utilizing two boxes. And you'll see this in a bit. 
we do this because we have an adaptive antenna system. Like I said, it's built for CBRS. We are on GO certified. We're at the maximum ERP possible. You're not getting anything better than us uh, as far as that's concerned. The, uh, and the full product range, we can deliver anywhere from 500 megabits up to 10 gigabits uh, if we're talking about our FW600, which is not out yet, but uh, hopefully will be out uh, in Q4 of this year. Uh, next slide. Sorry. Dan, can so, you see the slide? Yeah, it just wasn't uh, it wasn't coming up. I got some sort of lag in the internet. Okay. Big surprise there. So, so yeah. So this is our Blink uh, product line. Um, the flagship product is that product in the middle called the FW 300i. This is a very busy slide, so there's a lot of things going on. Um, so you can kind of read what the read what the specifications are. We're actually going to dip into uh, those specifications a little bit deeper. Uh, but the important part that I wanted to share with you that you can see with this is that um, these antennas are highly configurable. So uh, if you're if you put up and if you put up a uh, FW300, let's say put two FW300s, and those FW300s cover uh, 360-degree coverage, if there's particular areas that you just don't have any users, you can utilize that antenna to overlay into another area or to also add uh, in a fashion of adding uh, additional capacity by going to uh, uh, carrier aggregation. Uh, so the, the capabilities are just amazing with this product. Nobody else has got this kind of thing. Uh, of adaptive antenna systems. Uh, so uh, the uh, the other product we're going to talk about is the X300. Uh, the X300 is is uh, what we call uh, you know a gap filling product, but it actually works really well for private LTE networks um, that are deploying in small areas, small geographical areas like uh, like uh, mobile home parks or campgrounds, that sort of thing. Um, works works in, in extreme, extremely well in those environments. And keep in mind that these products um, have the ability to uh, have an integrated EPC. So you don't have to have an external EPC. You can literally bring an ethernet uh, connection, an internet connection to a switch at the bottom of the tower or on these down to the bottom of the tower and you can be online. That's that's how easy it is for deploying. Um, obviously, you have to configure. Yeah. So let's go to the next slide. So uh, that's that's basically the FW300i. That that one radio uh, that you see in the front, and then there's a one right behind it. Um, so there's actually two radios in this picture. If you look down at the bottom, you can see the antenna configuration. So 1CC basically means uh, one single carrier. So each of those care, each of those radios can uh, offer a 20 megahertz channel. So we're talking, you know, 80, 80 to 100 megabits per second uh, for each one of those uh, antennas, if you will. And then if you go to 2CC, we're talking uh, much closer to uh, 180 megabits uh, uh, for for the download. Um, and uh, and soon we'll be uh, offering 3CC, which uh, actually allows you to it, to move all three antennas over to one uh, particular radio, or all three radios over to one particular radio, and offer a 60 megahertz. So now you're talking, uh, you know, 400 400 megabits of capacity uh, potential there. Um, yeah. So I guess I should have had you hit this before. <laughs> so uh, obviously it's a very low cost, high performance uh, base station. Again, it's very, very small. Um, the deployment uh, deployment uh, requirements uh, are minimal compared to 
what typical uh, 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 fixed wireless access users are used to, which is deploying uh, antennas with cables and equipment and GPS and all that sort of thing. It's all combined right here. Let's go to the next slide. Uh-oh. I lost you. Here we go. So <clears throat> I will cover this more deeper in the uh, in the part two, but these are just some of the of the many configurations that you can uh, use for using our uh, our uh, antenna system. Um, you can uh, the far right uh, bottom corner basically is kind of the uh, general uh, deployment that you see. Yeah, right there. Um, where you actually have, uh, you know, uh, six 20 megahertz channels. This can uh, this can be deployed in a uh, frequency reuse of two, meaning you can only you, you can deploy this with just two 20 megahertz channels uh, and basically alternate them. But again, you can program any of these any of these uh, antennas to operate in any of these configurations that you see. Uh, the bottom uh, the bottom half is uh, utilizing two FW300, and then if you were to deploy three FW300Is, then you'd even have a higher capacity, which is what that upper line is. So the X300I, it's a Cat A device. It's tri-sector. Uh, it can deliver up to 500 megabits of aggregate capacity. Um, it works really well in the reuse of one um, and can support up to 96 users per sector. So how many sectors does this device have? Three. Three independent radios are actually operating in this device. It's very, very small form factor. It's designed to sit up on light poles. We've actually done some testing uh, in uh, Minneapolis, and uh, it's been really impressive. We're getting... Uh, anywhere from uh, 400 to 750 meters out non-line of sight. Uh, so it's an incredibly uh, nifty product. And keep in mind, this can work with both an external and an internal EPC. Um, so with the internal EPC, again, bring a switch and an Ethernet connection, and we can have you up and operating. So I've been talking a little bit about the EPCs. So the EPC uh, that we have, uh, uh, the product doesn't come directly with it. It's an additional charge that you have, but it's, uh, it's, it's a fairly uh, low-cost additional charge to integrate the EPC. Um, it's primarily there for smart, small private LTE deployments. Uh, again, it's very fast and economical. Um, there's not a real long uh, learning curve into it. There's just not a whole lot uh, that you have to go about configuring. So it's the perfect device to set up for temporary networks. Again, small networks like, uh, like, like I already said, uh, you know, uh, mobile home park is actually a very, very good fit for this kind of thing. We're also seeing uh, uh, smart city solutions where they're actually deploying these in light poles. Uh, and uh, covering, you know, again, areas from anywhere from uh, 400 meters to up to 700 100 meters more. So our uh, external solution uh, is an EPC called Rainus uh, by, by a company called Druid Software. Um, it is a server-based solution. Uh, you can have multiple deployment options. You can uh, host it as an ISP. It can be co-located with radios. Um, I've seen this installed and working really well just on a very simple uh, 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 Zotac uh, PC, if you're familiar with those, um, at the bottom of the tower. Um, it can also be deployed in data centers, um, or it can be de deployed as a cloud deployment. So it's really, really scalable. Um, it is very, uh, potentially very involved. It supports mobility. Um, we've actually done a little bit of testing along those lines, so it's uh, extraordinarily uh, 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 full of different configurations, uh, capabilities, and that sort of thing. It's 
at the end of the day, it's full featured. It matches pretty much anything that uh, that uh, Cisco can put out. Um, again, it's software, so you actually put this onto your own server. Uh, and again, I can talk a little bit uh, later or in part two of this uh, about what what's what we're able to play on. The next slide. So we also have Blink CPEs. Uh, the CPEs are uh, are, are uh, capable. Whoops. All right. We have both a cat. CAT-12 and a CAT-6 CPE, um, both of them have uh, high-gain antenna options. Um, these uh, provide, the CAT-6 provides up to 220 megabits with 2CC, uh, and the CAT-12 can actually operate in a 4CC environment. So if you're looking to, uh, you know, to head off in, uh, you know, uh, future, future potential deployments where you have 3CC and 4CC, Capabilities. That's probably the product that you want to deliver. Um, uh, that's about it there. And then finally, we have our uh, network management system called Netlink. Uh, it's a full uh, EMS functionality. It uh, utilizes a REST northbound interface. It also acts as a SaaS domain proxy. Uh, it uh, provides real real time data streaming. It's super highly scalable. Um, the, uh, the current iteration right now is basically uh, simple deployment uh, or uh, simple management of the products, but uh, there's a lot of things that uh, we're looking at uh, that uh, are going to be added in the next, uh, uh, the next couple of quarters uh, for advancement uh, uh, that uh, includes uh, managing clusters, high availability updates, uh, Patches, rolling updates, that sort of thing. So, uh, next slide. I think that's it. So I think that's it. Yes, we have a couple questions that came in. Um, <clears throat> let's see. The first question is, um, how can smartphones and tablets that are on your carrier networks, such as AT&T, with a SIM card access a private LTE network since they are typically carrier locked? Yeah, so um, so most of most of the products that we offer, like the RCPEs, we actually sell separate SIM cards. So you may have to uh, you may you more than likely will have to uh, uh, purchase a uh, unique SIM card for your network. Um, I think that's probably the only answer I can come up with right now. If that makes sense. Okay, and another question is, is this the same as FirstNet's nationwide system, or is it a separate system for government and local municipalities? I would definitely say it's a different separate system. So. Okay. Um, another question came in. Um, the throughput that was listed per the example, is the throughput through the AP correct? Um, and what is the throughput? Put per subscriber. So yeah, so LTE is uh, is fairly locked into what the throughput capabilities are. So on a 20 megahertz channel, you're going to see somewhere between 80 and 90 meg down, and anywhere from 10 to 20 up, depending on the subframe and frame configurations. Um, you can uh, you can uh, you can configure through the EPC, each one of the subscribers with a particular uh, 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 maximum uh, rate. So you can lock them into a 10 megabit rate or 25 megabit rate. So, you know, we're, we're not doing anything different than everybody else is doing as far as, uh, you know, you're going to have some, uh, you're going to have some, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, oversubscription rate. Uh, that, that you'll be able to assign, but uh, you can potentially as, assign uh, a user, you know, 75 megabits per second of throughput. I wouldn't recommend it unless you're on a 2CC environment, um, but uh, in a 1CC, what we typically see is 5, 10, and 25 megabits per second um, packages. 
Okay, another question. Can you comment on how the FW300i operates around foliage? So, um, so because we're using LTE um, and it uses an OFDM technology, um, we're able to uh, we're able to work fairly well in uh, non line of sight environments. So, but that's uh, kind of a that's that's a difficult question to 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 really nail down because what it boils down to is you know how much foliage are we talking about? Are we talking about a forest full of trees that we're going to go through? Are we talking about uh, you know uh, typical deployment from a tower from you know behind a house that's shooting a, through a couple two three trees? In that kind of environment, we excel. Um, but uh, in an environment where you're going through a forest full of trees, um, it really really depends. Um, we offer uh, uh, capability of uh, of assessing. Uh, uh, by creating RF heat maps, uh, what that uh, possibilities for uh, for throughput and capacity are. It's something that you would uh, talk to a blink person, uh, a, a salesperson about. We can offer um, the ability to, like I said, go look at a particular environment, look at the terrain and the details, and uh, submit to you a heat map that tells you exactly where uh, where uh, the uh, coverage is going to be good and where it's not. Um, another question, does the customer pick an SAS and then pay them the monthly fee? Yes, absolutely. So, yeah, so okay. so there's right now the FCC has approved, uh, I think, uh, five SAS providers, uh, Comscope, Federated, Google, Sony, and another company called Amdocs. Um, these companies as SaaS providers, um, now, if, if it's a UE device, you're not you're not going to pay. Uh, it, it only it only matters for the base stations. Essentially, is Class A devices, uh, uh, or Category A devices and Category B devices um, that uh, will be charged for, and it's uh, they're they're all doing essentially the same thing. And it typically is a monthly uh, reoccurring charge. Um, I think uh, we're talking, a, you know, a couple bucks kind of thing, as far as I know. I, I couldn't tell yeah. you exactly. But you, you definitely want to select a SaaS provider. We, we operate with all the SaaS providers. Okay. Um, another question. If a different SIM card is required to access the private LTE networks, can the devices such as smartphones and tablets with dual SIM slots, utilize both the carrier and the private LTE simultaneously, or do the devices require manual control switching between which SIM is issued, or, or can switching between the SIMs be automated? Yeah, so, uh, so the short answer is yes, we can. But uh, reality check is that it's really involved stuff uh, we're talking about, you know, much uh, higher level of uh, configuration details, that sort of thing. But yeah, the possibility uh, for operating both is is definitely there. Okay, and uh, another question: Can the private SIM card be remotely managed via the network software? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Wonderful. There was um, one more question about um, getting a copy of the presentation that describes the Blink gear. Um, we, you, we will certainly send that out. Um, do they just need to contact you, Dan? Yeah, that would be fine. Okay, great. Um, I think we have all, I think that's all of the questions that we have. We pretty much um, yeah. utilized the, um, our time slot and allotment. Um, I do, we do have one more question, though, since we've got about three, four more minutes left. So does private LTE doesn't sound to be supported if only one SIM is on a one SIM slot on the device? I'm not sure I understand that question, to be honest with you. Okay. Okay. We can probably um, answer that question off offline. Um, I'm not sure. 
exactly. Oh, we yeah. probably need some clarification. Yeah, feel free to uh, shoot me an email. It's dan.stewart at blinknetworks.com. I'd be more than happy to address that a little bit more in detail to help you out. Um, that's what I'm here and available for. Yes, that's um, okay. Well, it looks like we've uh, pretty much utilized the our, uh, part one of the webinar series. And um, I'd like to thank everyone for attending the webinar. And um, we will be having a part two, and the invitations will be going out shortly. So if you can attend the second part, that would be wonderful. And we will have this uh, webinar available on demand, um, and it will probably be available tomorrow. And Dan, I thank you, and um, for everyone that joined the webinar, please stay safe and uh, appreciate you attending. And sorry about the little bit of a lag in uh, the internet, but everybody is uh, using the internet nowadays. So um, have a wonderful day, and this will be the conclusion of our webinar. Okay, thank you.